right. Let's get going. Hopefully I can get done with the basic chromatography and move on to HPLC. Uh, this has been dragging. I don't have recap questions because we barely did anything last <laughs> on Monday. I just put that back up to, just to remind you of the three parameters that affect the column efficiency. And the column efficiency in, in, in particular, we look at height equivalent of theoretical plate. So, the shorter it is, the more resolution, the sharper is the peak, okay? So the longer it is, that means longer time to reach equilibrium, the, the, the band or the peak broadens, and then you have reduced uh, efficiency. So the three factors that impact the height, you have eddy diffusion, and then we talked about that. This is controlled by the size of the particles of your packing material. If they're large, you will have multiple pathways, and then you have a broader, the solute uh, stays longer in the column, so you have broader peak. The smaller the particle size of the packing material, the smaller is your eddy diffusion, the better is your resolution. B is longitudinal diffusion, because the solute moves down the column by diffusion from, low, from high concentration to low concentration. And also it moves in and out into your mobile phase. This is very much affected by the flow rate. If your flow rate is too, is too slow, the movement mostly is by diffusion, so you have broadening of the peak. If the flow rate is high near optimum, then you will have minimal diffusion, and then you have more transfer between mobile phase and stationary phase. C is the mass transfer for HPLC students. We talked a little bit about that in lab today. It's how fast you reach equilibrium, how fast your solute goes, interact with the stationary phase and goes out to the mobile phase and reach equilibrium. The faster equilibrium is reached, the narrower is your peak. So here I have temperature effect and flow rate effect. If the flow rate is fast and optimum, you have optimal equilibrium happening in the fastest time. So you have the shortest here, shortest height equivalent theoretical plate. But the flow rate, if it's too high, then you don't have time to reach equilibrium, then you have the opposite effect. Your height equivalent of theoretical plate becomes larger. So you have to always figure out what's the best flow rate for your particular uh, analysis. Another factor that contributes to the movement is the temperature. Some of you saw that we have the column in an oven and we regulate temperature. And the reason we do that is temperature reduces the viscosity of your mobile phase and increases the mobility, enhances the mobility. So you reach equilibrium faster because the solute now goes easily in and out and equilibrate because the temperature helps with that. So the, this is affected by temperature and flow rate. Also, it's affected by how, how well packed your stationary phase is. I'll demonstrate that. <clears throat> so basically, your stationary phase is made up of particles, right? packed, and each particle has pores in them. They're porous material. The smaller the pores are, the better is the transfer. You have faster equilibrium. If you have large pores, your sample or your solute is going to go in the particle and get detained and take more longer time to come in and out and equilibrate. So in order not to have this effect and have better resolution, you, tend, you want to use particles with small pore sizes. You don't have a lot of large pores. As well as, you'll learn this in GC more, is when you have capillary column. So here is hollow. There's nothing. And your stationary phase is a thin layer. So equilibrium happens really, really fast because you don't have much room 
for your solute to go in and stay and stay long, it's just a thin layer. That's why resolution in GC is much better than HPLC, especially when you use capillary columns. You have really sharp peaks compared to an HPLC peak that could be a little wider. Okay, so the movement so far is affected by three things, flow rate, temperature, pore size, and how much material you have of the stationary phase, okay? That makes it four things. <laughs> okay. Any questions on this? This is the efficiency of this equation. So the equation, so this is this part that deals with number of theoretical plate, the efficiency is one of the factors that affect resolution. So the next one is selectivity of the column. The selectivity of your stationary phase is something that is based on the type of stationary phase you have. Sometimes you choose a particular functional group that is more selective than another, but in many times you have control over selectivity by you adjusting the pH, for example, or adjusting the salt concentration, as in ion exchange chromatography, you are changing the selectivity of your stationary phase. So you can ch choose a pH that alters the charges or the density of the charges on your stationary phase. By altering the density, you are actually changing the selectivity. So you can control this attribute here. So some of it is based on the type of stationary phase you choose. Other is type on um, type of the mobile phase. So you can adjust the mobile phase um, to influence selectivity. So selectivity is a function of the adjusted retention time. And the adjusted retention time, just as a reminder, it takes into account the void uh, volume, so it adjusts for the peak front, front or the solvent front. So when the time of this peak becomes shorter, it stays less on the column, so it is less selected by the column, then you get um, peak in separation or no resolution between the two peaks. Or we call it other, in other terms, co-eluting, coming together. When the selectivity is enhanced by adjusting or choosing a different stationary phase or adjusting your mobile phase, like the HPLC folks talked about choosing methanol versus choosing acetonitrile, how that would affect your selectivity. You, the groups that didn't do that will talk about it next week. But changing the mobile phase really plays an important role in how selective you are and how well you can separate. Um, so it is, it's the selectivity alpha, which is calculated by the retention time. <clears throat> so here's an important note. Good selectivity is more important or could be more important than efficiency. Sometimes you don't really care for very sharp peak. As long as you have good selectivity and they're separated, it's okay if it's not a very sharp peak. So it's very important to have selectivity than efficiency. And in the equation, this is um, demonstrate that, that it is quadrat quadratically related to efficiency resolution, one-fourth of the efficiency. However, it is directly related to selectivity. Okay. The last component of resolution is capacity. And this is something that you start off with a constant capacity. And over time, when you use the column, you lose functional groups. Some functional groups can be washed off leave the column by just a reversible interaction. They get washed off with the mobile phase. Some functional groups get blocked. 
We talked about, for HPLC folks, we talked about using a guard column, and I'll explain that in a minute. The guard column protects the column. There's a guard column here protecting the column from impurities going into the column. But sometimes if you don't change the guard column in time, some impurities go in and uh, interact with your, your functional groups and block them. So you lose capacity. And we, when you lose capacity, retention becomes less on the column. Your samples elute faster because it's not retaining on the column anymore. It wants to come out faster. And if it comes out faster, then the coelution occurs. So there's not enough interaction with the column to delay it anymore. So this is the function of capacity factor. It has to do with the retention time. And this is the void volume retention time over the retention time of the void volume. So when this becomes smaller, this factor becomes smaller, which makes it a lower capacity. So the K prime becomes smaller when the TR becomes smaller. Any questions about selectivity, capacity? So once you lose capacity on the column, there are ways to regenerate the column. Sometimes you reattach functional groups. Sometimes there's nothing you can do. If functional groups are blocked, there's nothing you can do to regenerate them. So that's why when you say goodbye to your column. And the capacity factor says retention time minus void volume over void volume. Yeah, so this is the, uh, not, sorry. This is not, well, I'm going to go backwards. This is the, uh, the time until you see the uh, solvent front. So. So the time it takes for the void volume to come out. Okay. Hmm. Any questions moving forward? OK. So you achieved separation. Hooray. Sometimes it takes a long time to get there. Sometimes you have a method that you're lucky you have it. Uh, I told some group today that it's a, you might enjoy actually developing method or you might hate it. So it's either black or white. So I don't know where you fall. But once you achieve a separation, then you want to see, am I after detection and trying to identify what I have in my sample? So that's qualitative analysis. Or am I after quantitative analysis? So qualitative. You look for, OK, like we did for the caffeine sample, we looked at retention time, and we looked at comparison with the standard. Oftentimes, this works. You look at the retention time of your standard and your retention time of the solute. They match. Good to go. Sometimes it's not as easy. Sometimes you have two things coming out at the same time. So the retention time is not something that you can rely on for identification. So. Often you spike a sample if you don't have a standard. So what, what does it mean to spike a sample? So, or if you have a standard, but you don't know if your sample contains that com component. <clears throat> so you have a chromatogram with so many peaks. You don't know what's in there. Uh, or you, you're looking for caffeine, for example. It's, you're thinking this is caffeine, but you don't know. So what you do is you add to your sample a caffeine standard. So you kind of add a known concentration, just spike it, and then run your chromatogram. You'll see that all the peaks will look the same, and this one is going to increase, and all the thing else stays the same. So you know, oh, OK, so this is my caffeine. Photodiode array detector, I'll talk about it a little bit more when we cover HPLC, but this detector allows generation of a fingerprint of absorbance. So oftentimes, this helps a lot with identification. Sometimes it has its own limitation as well, but photodiode array detector gives you a spectra. Spectra here, you have your absorbance. Um, and then here, 
you have wavelength. Lambda. And the unit is nanometer. And then you can, with photodiode array detector, depending on which lamp you're using, if you're using a, a deuterium lamp, you can monitor UV from 200 to 400 nanometer. Every split of a second, so even I think it's like a very small fraction of a second. So every very small fraction of a, cell, of a second, you get a spectra. This is your lambda max. So in case of caffeine, this was 272 nanometer. So this gives you absorbances, that this is like 350, let's say, or 52. You'll see that at different, and here you don't have any absorbance, let's say at 380, nothing, zero. So it gives you, for every compound that is eluting and leaving the column, it gives you a fingerprint of it. Another sample might have this kind of a chromatogram, uh, spectra, sorry. It has a peak at 320 nanometer. So each compound will have a unique fingerprint of absorbance. So you can identify what you have. So photodiode array detector, that's one advantage of it. Um, detector, detection using multiple, multiple detectors and using peak ratios. So at two different wavelengths. Um, Multiple detectors, so you, you have a sample, you're suspecting that you have two compounds that are eluting at the same time. So you measure absorbance, and next you measure fluorescence. One of them will fluoresce, the other will not fluoresce, you hope. And then you will see with fluorescence that one will show up, the other will not show up. You'll see a change in the peak, and you go, ah, so I have co-elution here. Okay. Um, Using peak ratio, so you can, if you have, you, you don't have a photodiode array detector, you have, you can only set a detector at a specific wavelength, so 260 or 250 or 270, <coughs> and you have two compounds that will absorb at the same wavelength. You pick another wavelength, they will absorb differently. They, they are bound to absorb differently. Then you get the ratio and you get different ratio for each one of them. Um, separation using another chromatography mode, so if you detect co-elution, the example I gave you one time that two compounds might have the same size, you're using size exclusion and you're having them both come out at 10 kilodalton, for example, then you use ion exchange or reverse phase, then you will separate them so that you can detect them. Mass spectrometry, this, you're going to have two lectures on mass spectrometry. Again, it, it helps you with giving you additional information like the molecular mass. So if you know the molecular mass, you know how they absorb, you can look at the library and try to detect what you have. So you have different ways. You can add, the list can grow, and a mark can be added to this for structural identification as well. So really, you can do a lot of different things to detect and identify. Not, not here, you're not caring for quantification. You just want to know what you have in your sample and whether it's there or not. Quantitative analysis, that's when you are actually converting the area under a peak to a value. For HPLC, you get concentration. That is a full quantitative method. For GC that you did in the lab, it's a semi-quantitative relative. So you get a percent weight. So that's a relative. But if you want to do quantitation, you need to have a standard curve. So oftentimes, we, the software calculates an area. Some other software look at peak height. But peak height varies with your resolution, so it changes. Sometimes you have a, a very sharp peak, and you have a really, like nothing almost here. You don't, you barely have anything. And then it's really high, 
and it might change over time. But you know, the peak area will remain relatively constant, whether you have this shape of the peak or you have a shorter peak but wider. So these might have the same area. So most people go with area of the peak, no longer peak height. In, in very, very long time ago, people used to use strip chart recorder. It's no longer, you take, you, you have a grasping paper and then you use a strip, record, a strip chart recorder to record your uh, dimensions. But it's in so, pre, even before that, used to take your graph paper, cut it, and weigh it. So, so primitive ways, but no longer exist now. You have softwares that does this for you. So you get your peak area. Now, in order to do the quantitative analysis, some of you already have been uh, exposed to that by the caffeine lab, where you have standards at known concentrations. You run your standards, so usually at least three to four standards, and you get the area, and you plot. You do regression analysis, and you get equation of the line. And you have y equal ax plus b. So y is your uh, area, and then x is your concentration. So you have an unknown. You have the y for the unknown. You convert it to the x. Very simple. That's called external standard quantification. External standard quantification is what you did in um, HPLC, and also what you use to determine the semi-quantitative analysis for GC. Oftentimes, you want to use an internal standard. Do you know when you would want to use an internal standard? How is an internal standard helpful? And what is an internal standard? Nobody has used an internal standard before? Yeah, you're good. It goes, yeah, you're right. It goes, but I'll tell you a little bit why, what's the benefit of it. So an internal standard, as Nicole described, it's called internal because you add it to your samples and you add it to your standards. So you add a known concentration, and the same concentration goes in your samples and goes in your external standards. So let's say you have, uh, you have a chromatogram, and then here's your internal standards. So your internal standard is very similar in structure and chemistry to the compounds you're analyzing, but it does not elute at the same time. And it elutes within your run. If your run is 30 minutes, it should come out in your run. It shouldn't increase your analysis time. So it is similar in chemistry, but different enough to be separated. Now, that's what the internal standard characteristics should be, but what's the benefit of it? Let's say you have sample prep. Sample prep sometimes can be really tedious, like you did for the fatty acid analysis. A lot of steps, a lot of transfers. You might lose sample in, in the way while you might drop something, it's just uh, volume that you're taking is too small. You have a lot of error in preparation. So if you put an internal standard in your sample, the internal standard is subjective to same error as your compounds in your sample. So if you mess up preparation, it's going to mess up your internal standard as well. So you are accounting for your error by using an internal standard, sample prep error. Also, it's important in GC because sometimes you cannot control the volume you inject all the time because it's such a small volume. So it accounts for variability in volume injection as well. So basically using an internal standard you, reduces your error, whether it's due to sample prep or injection volume. So if you have an internal standard, use it. If you have a sample prep that's going to 
take a lot of steps, use an internal standard. But using an internal standard does not mean that you don't need external standards because you cannot quantify if you don't have the standards of this, this, and that. So you still have to have an external standard for quantification purposes. Okay, so, so what you do in this case is you prepare known concentrations of your external standard the way you do here for a regular set of samples. And then you will have an internal standard, like I said, concentration the same in all of them. So the what you plot is the concentration. Let's say you have three components here, x, y, z. And you have an external standard for each, x, y, z. You plot the ratio of the absorbance of x over the absorbance of the internal standard. That's how you correct absorbance of your actual sample uh, standard over the absorbance of the internal standard. So your concentration here is concentration of the external standard, and then you get an equation of the line. When you run your unknown, you also plot the absorbance of your unknown over the absorbance of your internal standard, and use that as a y, and you get the concentration of your unknown. What do you mean? Uh -huh. Yeah, you make your own standard. And That's why you owe, you get the ratio. When you get the ratio, you're accounting for that difference. Yes. 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 Heavily prepared. But you only, you only get the ratio within one sample. The one that was not heavily prepared, the standard, you get the ratio of that. So you're not taking a ratio of not heavily prepared to heavily prepared. So it is the ratio of the external standard to the ratio of the internal standard in a sample that was simply prepared. And then the ratio of uh, your unknown to the ratio of the internal standard in a sample that's been prepared. So it's within the sample, within the standard. Yeah, got it. Could you repeat what the ratio is one more time? What the ratio is? Yeah. OK, so when you're doing the standard curve, the ratio is the absorbance of your external standard over the absorbance of your internal standard. And the concentration here is the concentration of your external standard. And then when it's an unknown, absorbance of your unknown over absorbance of the internal standard, and that would be your y. And then you plug it in the equation to get x, which is the concentration of your unknown. All right? So think about it. And if it's confusing, you can ask me again. OK. Perfect, we're done with basic chromatography. Let's move on to HPLC. <clears throat> so we've seen the YouTube, and some of you did the lab, so some of you are really familiar with it. I just want to start introducing from the beginning the, the name, where the name high performance liquid chromatography came from. Originally, it was high pressure liquid chromatography because this is a column, an HPLC column. It's packed under much higher pressure that you would pack the bigger columns that I showed you last time. So this generates a really high back pressure. So when you have pumps, you'll see on the pump that a large pressure is generated because of the packing material of the column. So that's why it started as high pressure instead of low pressure liquid chromatography. But then development of the columns got better, and the stationary phase 
um, particles and particle sizes got better and, and people made them better. So you don't generate as much of a high pressure anymore, but the performance is much better. In performance, we mean resolution. So when you use HPLC column versus low pressure column, your peaks are much sharper and you get much better resolution. With low pressure chromatography, it's preparative. That means you use it to prepare and isolate, and oftentimes you need two liquid chromatography in a row to get purification, or three in a row to get purification. So that's why this is called now high performance liquid chromatography. And the time of analysis is shorter. So performance in general is resolution and analysis time. And by the way, this is uh, HPLC vials. Uh, we had a TA, her name was Courtney, or is Courtney Lasky, and she now is Co Courtney, not Lasky. Fake, right? Fake. I think it's fake. <laughs> now she's fake. No. <laughs> but these are your vials. Some of you already prepared the different samples for caffeine analysis. And she was creative that way, so she made them look into HPLC, took a picture, and now I use it. Um, yeah, okay, so this is part of what I said in terms of low pressure versus high pressure. So you, the analysis time is higher, resolution is better, columns are reusable and you don't pack them yourself. It's a pain to pack low pressure chromatography column because you pack them yourself and you have to have a lot of practice doing that, and sometimes it takes a whole day to pack a column. Sometimes you unpack and repack. But these, you just purchase them, and they're reusable. You can use them depending on what type of sample you're using, but in general, 1,000th injection before they start to go bad. But they might be used longer, but they might be used shorter, depending on how dirty or clean your sample is. Um, An easy sample recovery is just because you have better resolution, you get your peak is sharper and you can get pure peak, more purer than what you would get from uh, low pressure chromatography. Uh, this is the YouTube that we watched earlier and it's on Moodle, so we're not going to watch it now. Um, just refresher of the components, so you have your mobile phase, sometimes you have one. It's isocratic, sometimes you have two, it's binary, you change the gradient over time. Sometimes you have three, sometimes you have four. And then for each reservoir, you have a pump linked to it. Sometimes you have two reservoirs and a mixing chamber before a pump. Sometimes you have two reservoir, two pumps, and then a mixing chamber. So low pressure mixing versus high pressure mixing. High pressure mixing, I would say is better for uh, the consistency of the mobile phase. And then from the pump, the, the mobile phase get, goes through the injector where here you inject your sample in, and there is a sample loop. So, and then the sample goes in the sample loop. The mobile phase carries the sample from the sample loop and brings it onto your column. So the columns, I'm going to go talk about columns in a minute here. So it goes from the column you start having interactions with the stationary phase and then separation and then elution. It goes into a detector, you have multiple detectors. We're going to talk about different detectors later. And the detector is going to convert any signal into electrical signal that will generate a chromatogram for you. Oftentimes, you, your sample after detection goes to a waste. Sometimes you need to collect the sample, so you would have a tray of, of tubes and the sample corrector is timed like every five minutes to collect three milliliters or, or whatever. So you program it and it turns and you collect fractions from your run to use them for other analysis. <clears throat> so the pumps. They, they are programmed, they withstand high pressure, and you can program the flow rate. So you can control the amount of liquid or mobile phase that goes through onto your column per minute. So 
It can be 0.5 ml, it could be 1.2 ml, it could be 1 ml, and this you determine the optimum based on experimentation and you set your pump accordingly. Um, yeah, I already talked about low pressure mixing or high pressure mixing. Low pressure mixing, you have a mixer unit before, so the solvent mix before you get into the column, uh, into the pump, or you have two pumps and mixing happens after the two pumps. So this is an auto injector and this is a manual injector. The HVLC groups already saw these two. And and in the auto injector, you have a tray. You put your samples. Depending on the size of the tray, you can put 50 samples, 100 samples, depending on what you have. You can program the system. Go, come the next day. Your samples are all analyzed. You have a me mechanical needle that would withdraw the sample and then inject it automatically into the flow of your mobile phase. Um, if it's manual injector, you have to manually fill a syringe, use a needle, inject it, you make sure you rinse it, you inject your sample into the sample loop, which is, which is open to the mobile phase. Now, with the manual injector, you are just being there every 30 minutes or 60 minutes, and as time, you just in keep injecting the sample. Here, you can leave it overnight and not worry about it. Uh, sample stability is a factor when you have an auto-injector. So if you are analyzing um, phytochemicals or antioxidants, they might degrade over time, temperature and light sensitive. So oftentimes what you do is you have a cooler attached to your sample injector or auto-injector, and this cooler keeps your sample cool, prevent them from degrading overnight. And obviously, you get efficiency. You don't have to be there and not worry about injecting sample every run. Columns. So the columns, the outer component of your column is stainless steel. And it is very sturdy and inert and withstand changes in pH and temperature. So it's very sturdy material. And then your columns come in different sizes. So you have a regular size column. This is very common column size. You have larger column where you can do semi-preparative work, where you can inject larger volume of sample. You have smaller columns in case you have a small amount of sample. And this reduces also your analysis time. The longer column it is, the better resolution you're going to get, but the longer analysis time. So they come in different sizes. They're very sturdy, but if you drop it, the stainless steel is not going to break. What's going to break is your stationary phase that is packed in there. And it's going to break beyond repair. So you would say goodbye to an $800 column. Sometimes it's $1,500 column. So you have to be very careful with it. So. Pre-columns or pre-saturator between the pump and in the injector. Okay, so the, more, the most co common pre-columns are guard columns. Okay, So the function of a guard column, and, and those of you that did HPLC saw that. I'm going to pass around a very fancy and expensive one for Amy, guard column. Have a look at it. So the guard columns also come in different shapes, Michelle, and types. OK, so depending on the type of the column. So it's very small connection to your column. But what it does, it has the same inside material as your column. But what it does, it actually captures any impurity. So if you have anything that is I mean, just residue in your sample that pass the filtration step. You filter your sample before you inject. So if it passed the filtration step, then it will be captured here and not blocking your functional groups on your column. You do not want to block your functional groups, then you lose capacity. So guard columns are disposable. 
you reusable, first of all. You can reuse it multiple times, and then you have to change it oftentimes. Sometimes you see an increase in pressure in your system, and that could be to a very plugged um, guard column. That means time to change the guard column. So that the, within the column, when you have a column, your packing material will be different because you have different sizing of the column. So you have different internal diameters of the column. So the internal diameter of a microbore is the typical. This is a microbore. So it's a typical internal diameter of 0.5 to 2.5 millimeter. This is a very typical HPLC column. However, you can have micro columns, which I don't have here with me, or capillary columns. Here, the internal diameter is really, really small. And with these columns, the capillary are the hollow, so they are open in the middle, and you have a stationary phase on the side. Even in HPLC, you have capillary column. Um, so, so these capillary columns, they have an internal diameter that is much less than here. It's less than 0.5 millimeter. So they can be packed or capillary hollow. So they have very small particle size material, and they have very high resolution. Very high resolution because you have a very small amount of stationary phase. So you have a very, uh, the, surf, the mass transfer is really high. So equilibrium happens very fast. And these are typically your ultra HPLC. When you hear ultra HPLC, these are the columns that are either capillary column or microbore um, column, micro, uh, micro column, not the microbore. Okay. So with the with ultra HPLC analysis time is really fast. It can be five minutes, ten minutes, huh? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You could. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, good. They're usually expensive, and usually you cannot load a lot of sample on it. Um, good to use, but you know, depending on what you're analyzing and your need for it. Okay. So, what's the advantage, or what are the advantages of using smaller diameter columns? Agnes? Why? A and C. Why do you say all of the above? Uh, not necessarily column is longer. You were correct, but I, I want to know why you think this is correct. Yes, yes, you're right. So when you have a uh, smaller diameter, you have less packing material, so you have less stationary phase, so your transfer is, is fast, you reach equilibrium faster, so your resolution is really fast, so your peak, instead of looking like this, it will look like that. So the height will be different. The area might be the same. But when you have a height that is different, your sensitivity becomes greater. Because now, if you have a very low concentration, but you have a decent height to be detected, because this means your diffusion, longitudinal diffusion, or the time that it stays on the column is short. So it becomes very, very tight. So it's really concentrated in a very narrow spot. So if it's concentrated in a very narrow spot, your sensitivity is great. But if it is distributed, then here might be below the detection sensitivity or level. 
even though you have enough of it, but it got distributed, diluted out. It got diluted out so that every point you measure is below the sensitivity. Okay. So in choosing a packing material, so you want to make sure that you have a packing material can serve as a support or stationary phase or both. So sometimes your packing material can be both your stationary phase and the support. Sometimes you have a support that is inert and you have a layer of stationary phase on it. So you want to think about what would work best for your system. Particle size would be great. The smaller particle size, the better packing, the better resolution. And also pore. Pore size is important. Pore diameter. So you don't want your solutes to go into the pores and get delayed on the stationary phase. You want it to be stable over a wide range of pH and salt and temperature. You don't want it to break down on you. So it would be great. And then withstand mechanical strength because it's a, after all, it's a high pressure. So you want it to withstand high pressure compared to low pressure chromatography. So this is an um, example of a packing material where the, your, your packing material is both the stationary phase and the support. So you have silica bonded. The bonded silica could be either um, C18, like hydrophobic, or it can be cation or anion exchange. So you will have either a normal phase, reverse phase, ion exchange. So that's the bonded phase right there. Sometimes you have an inert court, core that is, doesn't have pores. So it does not let the sample go through. And then you have a thin surface or coating. Like we said, when you have less stationary phase, you have better resolution because you have less material for the solute to go in. And this is called pellicular, pellicular parking, packing, packing, gosh. So many P's and R's and U's. Okay. Again, you can have functional groups as ion exchange or C18 or what have you. And it's a very rigid core, so it's a very strong support to withstand high pressure. And the thin stationary phase improved resolution, like we talked about. So other types are the micropores and the macros. The micropores is the example that we had before for ion exchange type of resin for a large, when you are separating um, large polymers. And then when you have more, um, um, more cross-linking, you have smaller pore size. So it's just differences in the, in the pore sizes. Column ovens, so oftentimes you put your column in an oven to regulate temperature, and we talked about how that helps with the resolution and the, the viscosity of your mobile phase. So already discussed, enhances retention, uh, reduces retention time, enhances resolution, make your analysis faster, so that's great. To have columns, oven columns is great. Column oven. Uh, okay, so we'll stop here and we'll continue maybe on Fridays. Gary's time on Friday. I'll see if I can take some of his lecture time to finish the HPLC. We'll see. All right, see you on Friday.